Um, the Guatemala team came back, and I had asked Kent if they were going to uh, do a presentation this morning. And he got back to me and said they weren't. And he said, go ahead and burn the roast. So um, here we go. I added a few more things in, so we're good. Um, if you've got some crock pots up, maybe go turn them down. And yeah, um, my watch hasn't switched over yet. So as far as I'm concerned, I got about an hour and a half. So um, that's, that's from Kent. That's what Kent said. So you got a problem with that, blame it on him. Well, as Buck said, yes, uh, we are in uh, the, at, coming to the end of the book of 1 Timothy. And yeah, it, passionate goodbye. I, I think that as I was reading through this, I could almost just hear the heart of Paul like just kind of ramping up toward the end and, and kind of almost going back and covering everything. But what's strange to me is this is one of two of the letters of Paul that we have where Paul doesn't give some kind of final greeting and blessing and he just stops. He gets to the end and stops. But before he gets, it's, it's like he ran out of breath from all this passion that he put out. And we'll find he actually gives eight commands at the end. Just boom, 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 boom. Okay? So buckle up. We're going to drink from a fire hose for a minute. Um, I got really excited. And you know, when I get excited, I talk fast. So I apologize. The uh, online player, I think you can slow it down. So if you want to go listen afterward, that's fine. But I want to give you a, a picture. I think God is so gracious to us in giving us the Lord's Supper as a picture of what Christ did. And it's something we can touch and, and, and put our hands on. He didn't say, hey, remember that I died for you. He gave us something to look at that we finite beings could wrap our minds around and understand the breaking of bread and the pouring out of, of blood. And, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a... a, a an illustration that we can kind of put in our heads. And I don't want you to get caught up on who the good guy and who the bad guy is, okay? Nobody's the good guy, nobody's the bad guy in this little story I'm going to give you. What I want you to do is get in your head the images of, of certain words as we go through here, and I want you to be able to put an image in your head so you can really grasp kind of the strength of the word that Paul is using. Okay, so here's, here's the scenario, okay? There is a, a man who... Uh, robs a convenience store and in the process actually puts the owner of the convenience store in the hospital okay the sheriff gets the phone call hey we got a problem a guy robbed the convenience store sheriff is is headed out of town to pursue another case he calls his deputy and he says look we've got a problem i need you to take care of it and so the deputy Gets together the rest of the deputies heads out going after this guy well this guy has found himself a little place to hide and he hears that the deputies are coming, okay? So he takes off running. The deputies finally catch up to him, grab him, stuff him in the car, haul him off to jail, and the jailer obviously has to keep him until his trial so that he can stand trial for what he did. It all hinges, though, on the testimony of this witness who's hospitalized. So what do they do? They, the deputies send one of the deputies to guard the witness in the hospital bed. Okay? Everybody got the picture? Okay, let's go to 1 Timothy. If you would stand, I'm going to read the text here. Just stand. I think it's a good thing to mix things up to just maintain a reverence for the Word of God. These are the words of God penned by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the Apostle Paul to Timothy, and therefore to us today. Verse 11 of chapter 6. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godly, godliness, faith, Love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They're to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. 
thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Oh, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. And be seated. It is my hope and my prayer that I am not reading extra emotion and passion into that. So God forgive me if that's the case. That's how I read it. This is the last words of Paul in this particular letter. He's out doing something else and he has given a charge much as the sheriff did to his deputies. <clears throat> so let's break these commands down. There are eight of them. We're gonna, if you want to jot notes, I'm going to give them to you as best I can. Um, but the first, the first word, the first command that shows up to me is uh, right, right there in verse 11. And it says, flee these things. The word is flee, okay? The picture I want to go back to in, in this story I told you is once those deputies have, have decided to go after this criminal and he finds out, he flees, okay? The guy's probably looking at a long time in prison. He is getting up and he is going to get away from these police as, as quickly as, as, as humanly possible, and so I want you to have that picture in your head of fleeing. Paul doesn't say, hey, you might want to you, you avoid these things. Or, hey, you might, uh, you might think about just kind of setting these off to one side. Or you might, you know, keep an eye out. No, he says, flee these things. And that's the picture I, I, I want you to, to have there. Now, what are these things that we're fleeing? Well, to really take a dive into that, Go back for, to last week and listen to Buck's message because the, these things are the, the pursuit of, uh, of riches. And uh, just going to give you a quick note, verse, verse 9, if you back up a couple of verses. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Destruction's a big word. Paul brings the word flee to counter that big word of destruction. So there is a, a passion in Paul's word, flee from these things. But I think that temptation in the, in, the, in the pursuit of riches has a broader application. Okay, flee these things. Not only did Paul just talk about the pursuit of riches, but Paul spent the entire book talking about many things, Christian living and, and proper leadership and, and proper teaching, okay? So I want, to, I want to take a moment and broadly apply this fleeing from these things. Are you running away from temptation as if your life depended on it? Or are you kind of just checking and making sure that it doesn't get too close? Are you fleeing from temptation? Are you... Are you are you towing the line of addiction? And this could be drugs and alcohol. This could be social media, a cell phone. Are you towing the line and saying, well, I'm not quite addicted. You want, you want to know if you're addicted? Stop for a month. And about that fourth day, give me a call and we'll talk about addiction. For me, in some of the things that the Lord convicted of me this week, I stopped for two hours and started to have an issue for some of these, some of these things. So are you fleeing from temptation? And are you fleeing from the love of money and the pursuit of riches? So he says flee. Now the next word he uses there in verse 11 is pursue. And the image we want to get here is this desperate criminal takes off, and what do the deputies do? They pursue him. This guy is a danger to society. He could hurt someone else very easily. We've got to get this guy and stop him. The action that they're doing, this pursuing, that is the action in this word. I want you to see the intensity of police chasing a criminal. And he, Paul lays out six things that he wants Timothy to pursue. All right, so we're going to kind of go through them pretty quickly. We're going to pursue righteousness is the first one. We're pursuing righteousness. 
Now, where does righteousness come from? Righteousness comes from Christ. When we stand before God Almighty on Judgment Day, and, and we have our life to show, and God looks and sees righteousness, what is he seeing? He's seeing Jesus. So the righteousness comes from Christ. And if we're pursuing righteousness, we need to pursue Jesus. I don't think I'm taking too far of a stretch here in the text here when I say pursuit of righteousness is pursuit of Christ. Okay? How do we pursue Christ? We pursue Christ in fellowship with other people who are pursuing Christ. I was speaking with a friend uh, just last night, actually, um, about a particular small group he's involved in. And he says, you know, Aaron, you and me and a couple of other buddies, we've really, we've re really grown in each other in the faith. He said, but in the past six months, I have experienced more personal growth with this small group of believers who I didn't know before, before the small group than I did in six years with you and our other buddies. And we wondered why. Because we're, we're vulnerable, we're honest, we're, we're really transparent. But there was an intentional time put together specifically for growth. We'll go on a hike and hang out in the woods to have a good time. These folks get together for two hours every week with the sole purpose of pursuing Christ and allowing God to transform their lives. Our, I would say that that is an example of pursuing Christ in the intensity that it seems to me that Paul is, is speaking here. We also pursue Christ in worship. I'm a music guy. Music is a big deal to me as part of my worship. This was wonderful this morning. I just, just, this was probably one of my top three times in worship at Grace. So thank you to the team and thank you to you because a lot of that is, is you singing. So are we pursuing Christ in worship? And that puts us in recognition of our position before a holy God, before a righteous Christ, is to say, you deserve the glory. You deserve the honor. Paul's going to break into this, this worship here in, in the text we're going to come across. Just this, this explosion of worship. Are you worshiping God? Not just with music, but with your time and, and with your thoughts. And driving down the road and what are you doing at night? Are you binge watching Netflix? Are you spending time in, in, in the Word? Okay? Walking with Jesus, pursuing Christ is worship. And I think if we're going to pursue relationship with an actual person, we should probably communicate with that person. And that's through prayer. We touched on it. We've touched on it over the, the past uh, few, few weeks here as we've gone through 1 Timothy. And, and it, it's so important when pursuing Jesus that we actually talk and communicate and listen to what he has to say? Are we falling on our knees in prayer, in pursuit of Christ in the same way that the deputies pursue the criminal? Godliness, that's the next thing to pursue. Pursuing godliness. What's the difference between righteousness and and godliness. I tell you, I researched. Everybody is in a different spot on this one. There are, and some of them, some say, well, righteousness is this and godliness is this. And then you read the next one and they say, no, that righteousness is that and godliness is the other thing. And it's all across the board. So through prayer, through, through just kind of processing it through with some brothers, for, this is what it is for me. Righteousness is a, is a gift from Jesus Christ. Godliness is the putting off of sin to see a more godly life. Okay? Godliness is getting away from sin. It's fleeing temptation. Do you have someone who will hold you accountable? The person doesn't have to be at grace. I, I was with a buddy last night. Like I said, he does not attend grace. Do you have someone who will call you out and hold you accountable to help you put to death sin in your life? 
Are you transparent enough with a person to allow them to help you put sin to death in your life? That's a scary place to be. It takes a pursuit of godliness to put us in a place where we are willing to expose ourselves to one another. But if we want to pursue godliness, it's necessary to expose ourselves. You have to do it in a safe way. It has to be a safe person. You don't go tell your, your troubles to the whole world. But are you making space to be intentionally transparent with brothers who are going to call you out? Are you going to call me out for the way I talk to my wife? Are you going to call me out for what I watch on TV? Are you going to call me out for my participation in the body? Are you going to call me out for what I say from right here? Are you going to call me out for how I spend my money? Are you willing to be called out on those things for yourself? I'd encourage you, pursue godliness and as a help to that, get somebody to hold you accountable. Pursue faith. That's the next one. And you don't have to turn there. There's a story in Mark about a man who comes to, hear, hears about Jesus. His son um, is, is afflicted by a demon or demons. And his son will go into seizures and throw himself in the fire and, and, and all kinds of just crazy stuff going on. This, it's in Mark chapter 9, verse 17. You can go there if you want to later. So this man is brought to... This man comes to Jesus' disciples and Jesus is you know out in his solitary place. And Jesus comes back and the man says, I brought my son to be healed from this affliction. And your disciples couldn't do it. And, and you can just hear in the story his, his heart sink. I, 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 thought, I thought that if I brought him here that there, there, there was hope here, that, that your disciples... So his heart, his faith is just so low. He's just got just the tiniest little bit of faith. And Jesus says, you believe he can be healed. And the man responds. And this is a prayer I think that we can all go after. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Lord, I've got this much. I, I've got enough to, to even ask you. That's all I've got. I've got enough faith to say, help my belief, or help my unbelief. God, I, I, it's, it's, it's possible that she can put my marriage back together. Help my unbelief. God, it's possible that you can restore that relationship with my child. Help my unbelief. God, I have faith that you can do awesome things at Grace Community Church. Help my unbelief. God, I, I have faith that you can help me with this financial situation or help me draw closer to you or, or to help me put sin to death in my life. I have faith. I have, I have just a little bit of faith that you can break this addiction and break my bondage to sin. Help my unbelief. Pursue faith like that man pursued faith. There's an exclamation. If you read that scripture, there's an exclamation mark after that statement. Help my unbelief. I got to move on. Love. We're going to pursue love. Okay. Yes, pursue love of our spouse, pursue love of our children, pursue love of our parents, pursue love of our brothers and sisters in Christ. I think that's a little bit easier. Are we pursuing love like a deputy pursues a desperate criminal? Are we pursuing love of others the way Jesus did? Are we looking for and seeking out people to love? Perfect example of this, two weeks ago, a group from this church traveled 2,000 miles to another country. Why? Because they were pursuing love. They went and found somebody to love. But you've got people to love right here.
Jesus ate with sinners, prostitutes, and tax collectors. We've got them here. We've got those same kinds of people here. Are we pursuing relationships with these people to love them? Or are the bulk of our relationships a pursuit of people who will love us? Kids, are, are you, there, you know there's kids in school. You know the exact kids I'm talking about. The, one nobody, the ones nobody wants to hang out with. Nobody wants to be around. You know who I'm talking about. You've got an image of your, in your head. I know you do. Are you pursuing love of that person? Pursue steadfastness. That's the next one. Or some, some texts say perseverance. This is one that I, that I struggle with. Another one that God worked on me this week in. And that is that when the storms of life, if you will, come... Where do I instantly go in my mind? Am I pursuing a steadfastness that will trust and rest in, number one, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, and number two, God's love for me? Romans 8. Nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Am I resting in that consistently? I can rest in that, but can I rest in that consistently with perseverance? (coughs) Gentleness. The picture I got in my mind here with gentleness is burn victims when they're when they're in a a burn center and they're they're being cared for. Apparently, there's a cleaning that needs to be done of these burns on a regular basis, and it is incredibly painful. And there are two ways to do that cleaning. One is to just clean it, and the other way is to do it with gentleness. And I get this picture in my head of of a nurse coming to maybe a child who's been severely burned, and and they put their hand gently on the child's shoulder and begin to to work into cleaning these wounds. And it, it hurts. It hurts. But there is a gentleness there in the hurt. Sometimes we're going to be call, we're going to be we're going to be uh, convicted to call somebody out, like we talked about, right? Somebody's transparent, or or somebody we know is you, you know doing something that is really not godly, as they profess to be godly. We're going to have to call them out, and I think the gentleness here is the manner in which we call them out. The gentleness here is the way we love and the way we deal with difficult people. Are we pursuing gentleness? All right. Number three, command number three. We've moved off pursuit. Now we're fighting. The deputies have laid hold of the criminal and he does not want to get in the car. Okay? There, there are some that would call the Christian faith a journey, and, and I'm okay with that. There is an aspect that our faith is a journey. We come to Christ, and, and we begin on this, this process of being transformed into the image of, of Christ, and yeah, there, there's a journey aspect to it. We're, we're, we're here, and we're going there, but in some ways, it's not a journey. It's a battle, and the Bible is clear about that. We talk about the armor of God. We talk about we talk about, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the authorities. We talk about the sword of the Spirit. We talk about the battle belongs to the Lord. We talk about the devil prowls about like a lion seeking whom he may devour. Again, he didn't say strive for or work against or work toward. He said, fight the good fight of the faith. Living out our faith is the, is the fight. It is hard to be like Jesus. If you think it's easy, you haven't got it. <laughs> and, 
you can ask anybody who has tried to be like Jesus for any length of time, it is a battle. Fight the good fight of the faith. Like, like those deputies fight to get that criminal into the car. This is, this is not only it's a battle that comes to us, but it's a battle that we need to take out. We're not monks sitting in a monastery reading our Bibles every day, all day. We live in a world where a devil prowls about like a lion seeking whom he may devour. And fight the good fight of faith is an action to go out and fight against the work of Satan in the world. And that is proclaiming the good news to people so that lives are transformed. That means holding each other accountable. That means, that means fighting in every way possible to pursue the kingdom of God. Fight the good fight of the faith. The next command here is take hold. Some, if we look across the New Testament and look at this, there's a really great tool. I don't know if you haven't run across this, Bible Hub. It's online. And there are many ways to study Scripture that way. And one of, the, one of my favorite uses of that is their interlinear, where they put the, the Greek or the Hebrew, as it may be, and then the, a reference number, the pronunciation, the spelling of each word individually broken down. And if you click on the, the original word, it will show you every other place in the Bible that that word shows up. And often, the word that shows up for where the ESV says take hold, it shows up as C's, and it talks about that exact, um, that exact concept of of being grabbed by an authority. They seized Paul and put him in prison. They seized the disciples. They seized Simon of Cyrene. That The same word, they, they took hold or seized Simon of Cyrene to have him carry the cross up the hill. It's a very accurate picture of, of what it is. And what are we seizing? What are we taking hold of? We're taking hold of eternal life. And so there's, there's two messages here. As often I find myself up here, there's two messages. One message is for you, the believer. Take hold of eternal life. One of my favorite Bible teachers, Stephen Armstrong of Verse by Verse Ministries, says, he has this phrase he constantly uses, and he says, eyes for eternity. Do you have eyes for eternity? In the, in the football field length of eternity, this blade of grass that we're on of life is so small. Do we, are, we, are we viewing the things that happen today in the light of eternity? Are we, are we transforming our, our thought process to looking at things in the light of eternity? Now, the second, second message here is for those of you who don't know Christ, who have not submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, who, who have not trusted in Him for salvation, who have not admitted the, the, the wretches of sin in your life. There will be a day when life on this earth stops and that football field of eternity is before you. And what this book says is that if you are not in Christ, it's going to be really, really, really bad. And so this message to you is take hold of, etern of, of eternal life. Fall on your knees before God and take hold of eternal life. God, I am, I am broken, and without you, I am nothing. I am sinful. I have rejected you. I have lived for myself. I'm all done, and I need you, and I'm not going to let you go until I have eternal life. The cool thing about that is it doesn't take very long for him to respond to that right now. So if you don't know Christ, I beg you, take hold of eternal life. All right, the next one is keep. I charge you in the presence of God, verse 14, who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So 
Paul says, all right, Timothy, I'm going to give you a command here, but I want, to, I want you to keep a couple of things in mind. One, God give life, gives life to all things. And two, Jesus, when he was persecuted before Pontius Pilate, held fast and kept. So with that in mind, Timothy, no pressure, but keep. Keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach. And in our illustration here of this criminal, we, we have the jailer that keeps the criminal. If the criminal gets roughed up and beat up and doesn't get his rights, that whole trial could go. And the man could walk free. So the jailer's got to make sure that the criminal is ready to go before the judge. Jesus kept his pursuit of the commandments. Jesus kept his pursuit of being free from reproach even in the midst of persecution. Young people, when you say, nope, I'm not going to participate in that activity because it's not godly or prevents me from following Christ, you're going to be laughed at. Nobody's going to invite you over to their parties anymore. Nobody's going to want to be your partner for the class project. It's, it's not going to be fun. But, it, but Jesus stood before Pilate being persecuted. Paul, Paul, command, Paul commands Timothy with that in mind. I'm just watching my time here, for real. <laughs> We're going to go into the next one. Verse 17, charge. The sheriff charged the deputies to find the criminal. And Paul tells Timothy, charge the rich of this world to do a few things. Three things which really boil down to one. Do good. Be good. Good. So I charge us the rich in this present age. Well, Aaron, I'm not rich. Well, in 2011, 71% of the world lived on less than $10 a day. 71%. So if you make more than $300 a month or have access to more than $300 a month, you're wealthier than 71% of the world. To us, the rich, I charge us to do good. Open your home. Open your checkbook. Stop making fun of kids who have less and start offering to befriend someone who has nothing to offer you. We are wealthy people. 15% of Nuego County, 15% of people in Nuego County live below the poverty line. Now say what you want about parents and bad choices financially, whatever you want. But kids a lot of times don't have a choice. Parents, are your children inviting children over to your house that have nothing to offer? Parents, are you inviting families over to your home who have nothing to offer you? Do good. At the same time I bring this exhortation, I, so we found out this morning what generous giving, thank you, toward Guatemala. That's awesome. That's awesome that that, that that cost got taken care of. Proud to be a part of a church that gives like that. Now let's take that into the world here. Let's take that same concept of giving to every single day of our lives. Lots of poverty comes bad by, from bad choices. And something that struck me while I was, I was pursuing this is we have, I think, in our culture, a tendency to separate bad financial decisions from a lot of other bad decisions. We, are, we will divide ourselves demographically and in, into cliques and groups and associations. We will often divide ourselves along lines of economics of financial status. But we don't necessarily divide ourselves along lines of, of uh, infidelity in marriage. 
We don't necessarily draw our lines in um, uh, people choosing to live together before they're married. We, we don't necessarily choose to draw the lines between people who don't parent well. But we do draw a lot of lines financially. How many of your friends live, how many of your friends are at 50% of your income? How many of your friends are at 200% of your income? Just a thought. We are charged, we are charged to do good in the same way that the deputies are charged to go after the criminal. Then Paul brings the O. I don't think it shows up a lot in Paul's letters. It shows up a lot in the Psalms. O Timothy. Oh, Timothy. You read it how you want to read it. There's some kind of emotion there. Verse 20. In this illustration, there's a, a precious person, a precious child of God who's been hospitalized. And the deputy is sent to guard that person. The, the, Paul tells Timothy to guard the deposit entrusted to you. And I think there are several deposits entrusted to us. Elders, I got a word for you here. The people of Grace Community Church, you have been charged to guard that deposit. The people of Grace Community Church have been deposited with you. And you have to guard the people of Grace Community Church. The devil prowls about like a lion seeking whom he may devour. And part of your charge is to guard against Satan's attacks, the people in this church. Do you know the families in this church? When's the last time you talked to them? Now, I don't say this from a, a place that it's not my responsibility at all. Please don't hear that. I'm just reading the text. Paul's writing to Timothy, a leader in the church, and saying, guard the deposit entrusted to you. I, I got to admit, some of you, I, I don't even know your phone number. I don't know how to get a hold of you. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I don't know what's going on in your life. I'd like to change that, and I pray that you'd hold me accountable to change that. We have been entrusted with gifts. Right, Aaron said the G word again. Here we go. <laughs> we have been. We have been entrusted with gifts. God has given us gifts for the building up of others. You have a gift. Period. There's no but. You have a gift. If you can hear my voice, you have a gift. Doesn't matter how old or how young. God has blessed you with ability to bless this body. And that has been entrusted to you. It's not yours. It's for his service. Guard that deposit. Make sure that that man in the hospital makes it to trial to testify. Make sure that he's fed. Make sure you feed that gift. Make sure that that gift has what it needs. And uh, this doesn't let other leaders off the hook here that somebody needs to use their gift. Leaders... Our job is to equip the saints. That's why we teach up here. That's why we have uh, uh, Sunday school and, and children's church and, and Bible studies. We're equipping the saints to use their gifts. All right, the last one is avoid. Verse 20. The criminal avoided the police. 
I think we're kind of coming into the flee area again. We are fleeing. We are avoiding, like the criminal avoided the police, useless babble and false knowledge. When we're up here, we, we can't be running useless babble. When we're out in the world talking to people, it's not about useless babble. It's about advancing the kingdom of God. When we leave here, when we leave this place, the work begins. When I pray and we sing and it's over and we get dismissed, we're not dismissed, the work begins. And that work is not running out into the world and arguing everybody into our position on eschatology. The work is not arguing everybody into a position on, on infant baptism. It's not arguing everybody into our, our agreement with us on what the word flee really means. It is exhorting people toward godliness. It is equipping the saints toward love and good works. It's preaching the gospel, the good news that Jesus saves, and we are no longer, we no longer need to be bound by sin and death, and we no longer need to be slaves to sin. We need to avoid useless talk and useless knowledge the way a criminal avoids the police. We've got to agree to disagree on non-salvation issues. Because the more time we spend arguing about that, the more divided we look to the world around us who needs the one thing we all do agree on. Amen. And in true Paul fashion in 1 Timothy, let's pray. Father... We love you. We are drinking from a fire hose of commands here. There's so much to do. There's so much to change. God, probably all of these things I could work for the next thousand years and not even come close to the righteousness I need. But the last words, God, that Paul brings to Timothy, grace to you. Lord, we need your grace in this. We need your grace to help us keep from beating the snot out of ourselves, though we fail. But we also need your grace to empower us to do these things. Lord, we recognize that if we could do these things, we wouldn't need you. And so we, we fall on your grace. And Lord, would you speak to us today these last words of grace to you? And would you transform us by your grace? Would you transform us that we would obey these commands in every little facet of our lives? We thank you for who you are and what you've done and the finished work of Jesus on the cross that allows us to even come before you in prayer. And we pray these things in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen.